Welcome everybody to another episode of the Strength and Knowledge Podcast. I'm very, very excited to bring to you one of our featured presenters from the recent Strength and Knowledge Summit, Dr. Nicole Sertica, who is the Director of Rehabilitation for the OL Reign, and they are a part of the National Women's Soccer League, which is the highest soccer league um, in what, North America, Nicole? It's yeah, it's the the highest level of professional women's soccer in the country, and it's also considered to be the best professional league for women in the world. That's awesome. Uh, I know um, I've I've gotten to interact with some of our Washington Spirit players around here, and it's just been uh, really just tremendous seeing the elevation of the players, elevation of the sport, and overall just the familiarity of everybody in the area to that team. With regards to elevation and progression, I mean, what was your trajectory like to get to the point where you're now in this role with the OL Reign? Yeah, so I I basically always, soccer was always part of my life. I played soccer my whole life. I played at a Division I school, St. John's in New York. And even going through PT school, I was a youth soccer coach. And so I always knew soccer would have to be part of my career somehow. I just couldn't imagine kind of going through life without it being a part of what I was doing. Now, I wouldn't necessarily say that I set out with the expectation to work for a women's professional soccer team because when I first started PT school was actually the first year of the league's existence. So it wasn't ever something that I could look at and say, oh yeah, I want to work there because (laughs) it didn't exist. Um, And then even the first couple years of the league, I reached out to a couple teams, but they really were just using volunteer athletic trainers for games. And that was really the extent of their health and performance teams or their medical teams and support for the athletes. So it's kind of been an interesting parallel in that as my career and I've been growing professionally, the women's professional soccer leagues and the commitment and investment in women's soccer has also continued to grow on that kind of that same trajectory. So I feel like I've my own personal growth has run in parallel with women's soccer growth, um, which is nice. So it, I guess I, you know, I, since graduating PT school in 2015, I've worked in a couple outpatient clinics, have worked with athletes and had my own practice for a few years where I worked mostly with soccer players, but also, you know, general population as well. And I guess it just kind of, I, I know a lot of people in the soccer medicine and soccer performance world and heard about an opportunity and decided to go for it. That's awesome. I mean, you seem like you're right where you want to be and right where you were meant to be. Um, Just looking at your content, whether or not it's your website, um, recently got to see you present all the different videos that you had in there, your social media. I mean, you've been able to carve out this very, very nice niche for yourself. For some of the people that maybe are getting more into sports-focused rehab and who don't have the familiarity with certain sports, what is a way that you can suggest to them to analyze a sport so that they can better uh, work with people that are in that sport and take them through a rehab process? Yeah, that's an important question. And something I consider a lot is that I feel like I'm where I'm at largely because of my knowledge of the game as well. You know, like I said, I played division one, I played semi-professionally before there was a pro league. And so I, I understand the game very well. I was also a coach so that helps. I, I think that that has given me a lot of value and has helped me to stand out and is helping me to have success in my current role. But I wouldn't go so far as to say that it's necessary for a success in sport. I think that as long as you're communicating with coaching staff appropriately and, you know, trying to learn your craft and learn your game that you're working in as much as possible. So I'll give like a concrete example. I have an athlete right now who is towards the end of ACL rehab or towards the middle end of ACL rehab, but there's things that she can do with the team and that I want her to start practicing. I can only do so much in a one-on-one session or even with only two or three other athletes. 
So having her be able to be integrated where possible is important for her rehab and her recovery and return to performance. But in doing that, I have to communicate with coaches. Okay, she can do rondos. She can be a floater in possession games, but I don't want her to be neutral in small-sided games yet. And so being able to know what all of those terms mean. Now, I wouldn't be able to go and do that in basketball or hockey because I don't know that jargon. I don't know the vernacular of the sport. I don't know what the different drills and sessions look like, but that doesn't mean you can't learn them. Like you can always ask the coaching staff uh, to break things down and say, instead of saying, okay, she can be floater or do rondos, but not defensively, or she can, I don't want her to be in small sided games yet. You can instead say, I don't want her to have to defend at all. I don't want her to have to react with the ball at her feet very much. And I don't want more than four or five players around her. So then you and the coaching staff can kind of work together to determine what that means in the context of a training session. No, that's really good. And it actually reminds me of a, we'll kind of almost use a, a chart. It's like right when they start to go back, you're doing dynamic warm up, you're doing indies, right? You could be doing something that's position specific potentially without anybody it's all pre-programmed you're going through yeah. um almost like your feed forward loops right your, your your rehearsal of certain skill tasks and then at the end reintroduction to conditioning but you're not in you know odd-sided drills you're not in even sided drills um and that read react component is entirely out i think those are things that can be applicable to to everybody and then um, I don't know how you feel about it. Usually those odd situation drills also having a little bit more of a rehearsed way of rotating, right? Somebody kicks the ball this way. I drop to the hole, right? There's certain footwork patterns that are a little bit more predictable and rehearsed, say, um, compared to then we get into big sided um, and then potentially small sided. And I think sometimes, and, and I'm curious your thoughts here. I almost feel like small sided because there's less people, so many more reps, so many more cuts, so much more movement. Whereas like, and granted, I don't claim to be an expert on soccer. Whereas I watch all of the people on the field and they don't, they, they're, I don't want to say they're moving uh, a little bit more in this gradual shift back and forth. And there's not, you know, there's obviously moments where there's significant changes of pace and cuts, but you talk about putting somebody, I mean, not watch futsal. I mean, it's, it's, it is fast. A lot of, a lot of cuts, right? I mean, a, any thoughts on just the, the general progression I was just referring to? Yeah, I that's. I might have put it a little bit in a non-soccer. No, uh, that's great. Driving it, that's, so. that's a really great point to bring up because I think a lot of people assume that when coming back from an injury, okay, you're going to do individual stuff and then kind of do 1v1, 2v2, 3v3 and build up from small-sided to large-sided. But that's not always the case. And it's going to be injury-specific. So we, in soccer, we have maybe in other sports too. I don't know. I just know soccer, but we have what are called intensive and extensive drills. So extensive would be when there's a lot more space. And so that would be kind of the larger sided games, 8v8, 9v9, 10v10, 11v11 in soccer, larger spaces. So in those situations, in those types of games, there's more space for athletes to have more high speed running distances to cover more distance overall and also to reach higher speeds. So that's when we're looking at exposing them to high speed running, exposing them to peak velocity and those types of physical metrics. Now in a small sided game, there's going to be a lot more change of direction, acceleration, deceleration. The high metabolic load distance is going to be higher. They're not gonna cover as much space, not as much high speed running distance or speed in general not many sprints, if any, because nobody can hit a sprint uh, pace in less than 20 yards of space. So when we're thinking about an ACL injury, the things that are going to be more difficult are the changes of direction, accelerations, decelerations. That's a lot of neuromuscular load. Now, when we look at the extensive drills, maybe if someone's coming back from a hamstring injury, we want to start them small sided and then go into the, the larger sided games or the extensive drills, because the risk factor there is the exposure to high speed running. 
And so maybe we want to protect that in a hamstring strain injury, but in an ACL injury, maybe we want to have them doing that first because one of our first progressions is linear movements. And so we can increase the intensity of linear movements in an extensive drill and then bring them into small sided where there's more of the change of direction and the high metabolic loading. I love that. I think that's just a great way of, of viewing it. And hopefully it's something that people can start to draw parallels um, between, between different sports and watching a sport, observing, breaking out the, the different pieces when this particular movement is happening, when that particular movement is happening. For you, you mentioned a little bit about just um, the, the load, neuromuscular load, player, you know, the, the overall player load of a, a given activity. For people that were not on your presentation um, at the summit, what is the, what is the vest again that you've, you've recommended? I, I like to use stat sports. Again, we, we use that with the entire team, but when I was, when I had my own practice and I was working one-on-one with athletes, I have my own, it's called stat sport, uh, apex athlete series or athlete apex, something like that. And they're pretty inexpensive. Again, like it's what, two or $300. They are usually on sale around holidays. So hold out for a holiday and then buy it on sale. Uh, I think President's Day is coming up. So wait for that. Um, If they have a sale, I don't know. And yeah, I mean, it's a really simple piece of equipment. It's an app, then it comes with an app on your phone and you can track the session live. So if I'm working with an athlete who were trying to work on peak velocity and exposing them to high speed running distances, I can see live what speed they're hitting and how many total meters they've hit, how many meters of high-speed running that they've hit. So live, I can say, all right, that one was 7.4 meters per second. Let's see if we can get up to 7.6. And then, oh, that one was 7.5. Can you beat that? And so it's a really great way to motivate them to get to higher speeds and also for you to track live during the session. So then if you need to change what you're doing, and there's often been times that I've noticed, oh, they're not really getting the speed that I want out of this particular drill. Let me open it up 10 yards and see if we can get it that way. And that's the value of that. You can also then go back and download the session to your phone and see even more metrics than what it will show you live. So it's a really easy way to track these metrics. It's not expensive and yeah, it's not cumbersome. It's just a vest. It looks like a sports bra and you put the little GPS unit in the back of it in a pocket. That's awesome. I mean, I, I, I had never heard anybody and it sounded like you had done it even in an outpatient setting. Um, yeah. heard anybody doing that before, uh, I can assure you, I'll be picking your brain at some point about how you made that happen. Uh, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. It's just something that, I mean, I listened, I was like, Oh my gosh, such a great idea, but that goes with like the personalization, right? You're individualizing things. We've talked a little bit about people being, um, you know, being in a position where we're, we're making certain considerations for what they're doing in practice. In addition, you have also touched on the fact that we need to be mindful of position specific differences. Um, can you share a little bit about what goes into your uh, thought process with determining what certain positions need to do in soccer? Um, and maybe some little gems of, about what, what you've seen in other sports or things that we could draw uh, to, to have parallels in some of these other team sports? Yeah, I mean, I think it all boils down to if we're preparing an athlete for something, we have to know what we're preparing them for. And we can't just send them back and say, okay, like you're strong enough, you're fit enough, you have no pain, go ahead and play. Well, how do we know that they're fit enough, strong enough, uh, healthy enough for the demands if we don't know what the demands are? And so you can take, there's a lot of published data, like normative data on the demands of soccer at different levels of competition. I'm sure there's data for this in other sports as well, but on top of, or I guess deeper than just the sport specific demands, this is where maybe having a little bit more knowledge about the sport can be really valuable. And again, if you don't, that's okay. Just ask someone, ask the coach or learn from someone, take a a coaching course and figure it out or read some literature on it. But in, in soccer, for example, 
let's say a team is playing a 4-3-3 um, formation. So that's four defense. The goalkeeper is usually not included in the numbers for a formation, unfortunately. But so it's four defenders, three midfielders, three attackers. So in many cases, when a team uses this formation, the outside backs have to get up and down the field a lot using the space in front of them. So they cover a lot more high speed running distance and hit higher speeds, higher peak velocities than what the center backs do. So even though it's still the same sport, still defense, it's still vastly different demands. So I think that having some information about that is really important because if we are trying to get an athlete back, again, it comes down to what are the specific demands that individual is going to have to face. We can even look at the same exact position, so center midfielders, and they might have a different set of demands or a different set of strengths as an athlete than another center midfielder on their team. And that actually is often the case because it's nice to have one center midfielder who is kind of the creative attacker who finds spaces to penetrate and that and has really high technical ability and then the other one who is a ball winner and a tackler and can help organize defensively and really plug in the holes in the middle of the field and so an example if you follow women's soccer would be somebody like a Rose Lavelle versus someone like a Julie Ertz both technically central midfielders now we would break center mids down even further to say Julie Ertz is a number six, whereas Roosevelt is a number 10. Um, those are different positions. But still, if we break down the position, there's different demands even within that. So questions I always like to ask athletes are, what are your strengths as a player? And what is your role on the team? Or what are the things that your coach looks, for, looks to you to do for the team? And athletes already know this. They'll tell you, oh, I'm a really good playmaker. Uh, I'm good at sending long balls. I'm good at winning balls in the air, good at taking people on 1v1. Whatever it is that they tell you, you should make that the priority. Learn the demands of what that is. If it's beating people 1v1, that means you're gonna have to work a lot on change of direction and acceleration because that's what that entails, changing a direction to throw off balance of the defender and then acceleration to get past them into space. So I always, if you don't know the specific demands, just ask the athlete, what are your strengths on the field? What are you best at on the field? And work those demands. I, I like that. And I, I guess that leads me to a, a, another question, but it's kind of related to feedback. I mean, are you incorporating anything like RPE? How are you determining, um, you know, the psychological readiness piece? Maybe, maybe it's just the RSIs or anything else. Uh, and then how are you making sure that what you are seeing physically is aligning with some of these more subjective um, you know, interpretations of, of where that individual feels like they are. Yeah, I always, I'm, I always get feedback from the athlete. After every session, I do ask their RPE, you know, right after they've taken their boots off and are before they head to the parking lot, I say, okay, how hard was that session? And we're actually playing the performance director here at OL Rain and I are playing around this year with breaking down RPE further into RPE lungs and RPE legs. So athletes sometimes will say like, well, early on when I was doing sprinting, it was a seven or an eight. But then when we did the technical piece, it was a four. So, you know, a lot of times they give you that information already. So now we're, we're going to kind of play around with that this season and see how that helps us or doesn't <laughs> by breaking it down further. But yeah, I always look for feedback. And a really good example is, again, one of my athletes I'm working with now who's coming off an ACL injury. We were doing, um, in the Smith machine, we were working on power. And so starting in like a split stance position and doing a knee drive up into triple extension for some calf power and getting that like stiff, torso during an explosive task. And we used the same amount of weight for each side and both sides looked phenomenal to me. And then I said, hey, how did that feel? And she said, I felt such a difference between my right and left side. I couldn't see a difference. It looked just as fast. We used the same amount of load, but she felt a difference. So to me, that tells me that that's something I need to continue to address. And if you aren't getting feedback in that specific situation, I would have said, hey, she's doing really well with that. I can move on. 
but getting the feedback bit and the subjective part of it, how does that feel for you? Do you feel even side to side? Do you feel any differences on your surgical versus not versus non-surgical side? Or even give me an RP, a leg RPE for your right and left side. And they can tell you then, oh, that was a lot harder on my right side or my left side, whichever their surgical side is. And then you know, okay, probably don't progress that just yet. I mean, I yeah, I I love that. I mean, that's something I've I've asked inconsistently, but I I mean, I can only think of like early stage rehab. It's like, all right, well, you got sled and bike, probably a lot with regards to conditioning, and you get to a certain point where you've acclimated to the task, and then as we add new things, whether or not it's linear running or whether or not it's COD drills, um, obviously the body's going to be able to going to be put in a position where it's going to respond differently. And I, I think that's, I mean, that's very, 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 very relevant because a, a seven legs versus a seven lungs probably has me thinking very, very different things, um, potentially being a, a little bit more cautious of ramping up the numbers with regards to a limb, right? So if I'm getting closer to uh, a threshold point um, or some level of fatigue with legs, that being a lot more concerning than if somebody's just panting a little bit, right? And they got their hands on their thighs. So, um, Nicole, this has been great. I mean, if you don't mind, I want to go into just a couple of small things with regards to you, the professional, you have a lot on your plate. Um, you obviously are taking a new role. You're in the process, right? Of getting situated in a new home. Um, you're doing a great job with things on social media. What, what keeps you structured, um, with all of these different things going on and maybe what recommendations can you have for some of the younger professionals that look at you and they go, Oh my gosh, I don't know how she's juggling all this. <laughs> um, I w- when I had my own practice and before, so before this role, people often asked me that, you know, you have a blog, you do social media, you see patients, how do you keep track? And my answer was always, Yes, I see patients, but I see patients for far less hours a day than the typical physical therapist does. And I say that because what I don't want to happen is I don't want young professionals and students to look at my social media and say, I'm not do like to say about themselves that they're not doing enough. Say, wow, look, at, this is what it takes. I have to work this hard to succeed. Look at all that Nicole does. But that's not the reality, right? Like, my, my life is far more boring than what it seems on social media. I promise you that. And I promise you I'm much more like most people than what it might come across on social media. So that's my first thing is I never want somebody to look at social media and say, I have to do more to keep up. I have to do this in order to reach that goal. Yes, you have to work hard. And yes, I have worked really hard. But at the same time, for two and a half years, I was working with patients for a maximum of four hours a day. That's an absolute maximum. And so I had a lot of extra time to be doing the other things that I was doing. So that's kind of like the the main point I want to get across is I had a lot more time than what it probably looks like on social media to do those things. Now I am much busier. (laughs) I, I do have a lot going on right now with the team we start preseason next week. And so right now the bulk of my time is planning COVID tests and getting those sorted for the athletes, planning out what preseason is going to look like. We, we just have a lot to do right now. So to stay on top of that, I'm a big list maker. I, I make a list at the start of each week and then I'll show you my planner here. <laughs> so it's like each week, I, so this is for this coming week. I'll show you last week to as a, so I start with like, a list on Monday. And then if I complete that task, I cross it out. If I don't, I carry it over to Tuesday. Mm -hmm. And so that's how I stay on top of things. I'm also a big notebook person. And so in my notebook, I have weekly priority items and then I can cross it out when I've done it. So lists are my best friend. Everyone has their own method. That's mine. No, I I mean, I I love it. I mean, what I'm hearing is like, you've, you've owned your time very, very well. Um, I think, yeah, the perception of busy on social media can be uh, a lot more. Um, usually is definitely not the opposite where somebody looks at somebody's social media and goes, oh, well, they're not really doing much. That's yeah. <laughs> That's what people have. So I can relate a little bit to how you do your carrying over. I'll do that a little bit more in my calendar 
I, I got, uh, you know, familiar with something called defensive scheduling, right? Where you're clearly blocking all your, I mean, I even block like going to the gym in the morning, right? It's, yeah. it's there on it, right? You've got certain periods of time where you're reading, doing this, that, and the other. And some of them are almost if you get into like your fixed expenses and variable expenses, I have like fixed weekly activities and then I've got variable activities. The, usually the variable ones I'm plugging in on Sunday or Monday, the fixed ones I can move anywhere throughout the course of the week. So um, I definitely just, you know, appreciate having some, some similarities there with regards to things that work, but. Nicole, yeah, that's what Mark does. Mark schedules like that with the blocks on his yes. calendar, on his computer. I am a very low tech, I'm a pencil and paper person. So I need to write out my lists or it can be on my computer and I can look at it and see it and know that it's there. But if I don't, if I haven't written it out, I'm going to forget. I usually have projects and it's funny that my computer actually is stacked on two of my project notebooks. But <laughs> if I'm working on like task completion or projects, that's where I'll usually just kind of just go. Yeah. Through. So, um, but not to, you know, obviously uh, put, oh, I, I, yes, we've got to, we've got to wrap up today. So um, <laughs> for everybody who's listening, what's the best way for them to keep up with you? And if you want to just plug anything that you have coming up, feel free to. Yes. Yeah, so I have a blog that I will start again, talking about busyness. I've been busy with my job, so I haven't been as active on my blog, but I did just finish a new blog that I will be posting tomorrow morning. And so you can follow my blog. It's NicoleCerticaPhysio.com. And I'll be writing updates about my new role and my life. And then I also write blog posts about rehab and different injuries and my thoughts and views on the research on those injuries and how I go about rehab for those specific injuries. So you can follow that on my website. I also have some eBooks that I sell on my website. They're easy to find there. I'll be putting some courses up every now and again, some webinars, but I do have a course on Eric Mira's website, the sciencept.com. That's ethical return to sport decision-making. So it's all about how I view return to sport, but I threw in some ethics content so that it can count as an ethics con ed course for everyone who needs that. <laughs> I, uh, yeah, I, I have to, I wrote that down after last week's summit and I have to dive into that. So, um, I'll make sure that I put that, uh, in the notes with this, but other than that, uh, Nicole, thank you so much for making some time. Um, I know that you got a ton of great feedback after last weekend, and I think you'll probably have a lot of, a lot of new fans. So awesome. Uh, yeah. I'm, uh, I'm excited to hear about your new role. I'm sure we'll catch up at some point, but thanks again for joining me. Thanks so much for having me, Josh. I appreciate it.